Uh, I am Richard Winter, and uh, I have been teaching counseling uh, at Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis in the United States for the last 25 years, uh, and doing counseling and psychotherapy. And uh, just last year, I retired from full time, so I guess I'm now Professor Emeritus of Applied Theology and Counseling. And I am delighted to be sitting here with you, Eric. Uh, and uh, Eric is Eric Johnson uh, has a long and distinguished career in teaching and practicing and writing about Christian counseling. He was trained as a psychologist uh, some years ago, and he edits um, edited Psychology and Christianity: Five Views, and was co-editor of Evidence-Based Christian Counseling and Psychotherapy. And he's written over 50 articles in psychology and theology, and recently several very important books. Um, two of these, one, Foundations for Soul Care, a Christian psychology proposal, and then more recently, God and Soul Care, the therapeutic resources of the Christian faith. And these are two very important books that I would love to discuss some of the major themes that come out of your writings that we'll do in a moment. And uh, until recently, Eric was the director of the Society for Christian Psychology, and he serves on the board of the Institute of Christian Psychology. Mm -hmm. Now, I hope I've got all of that, that right, was great. Eric. That was great. So it's a delight to, to be with you here to talk about some of these things. And maybe in your responses to the questions that I ask you, you can clarify exactly what the Society for Christian Psychology mm. is mm -hmm. and, and some of its unique uh, aspects. So let me, let me ask you firstly, um, perhaps you could start by briefly explaining to us the range of views that Christians take to psychology and, and why this diversity exists. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, the Christian community has has had its own kind of psychology for centuries, going back into biblical teaching. Every complex culture has some kind of psychology, some kind of sense of what human beings are, how they, uh, what 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 a, a, a healthy human being looks like, and what can go wrong with us. Christianity is is no different. Um, but in the late 1800s, uh, a uh, a a new version of psychology developed that was based in the worldview of naturalism. Uh, there, there were some good features about it. It, 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 it sought to, apply, uh, to use natural science methods and to study human beings and to get a more accurate understanding of them. That was great. Christians would relish that. But at the same time, the, the sad thing was that, that the, most of the leaders were, uh, had become naturalists, uh, were, uh, adhered mm -hmm. to the worldview mm -hmm. of naturalism. So it was a twofer. It wasn't just a, a, a heightening of experimental and statistical precision, but at the same time, there was a secular revolution, what Christian Smith called a secular revolution was going on in Western culture. And, and so the version of psychology that developed was devoid of reference to God, to, the, to the, the source of power that we as Christians recognize, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection and the, and the gift of the Holy Spirit that we need in order to get better. Uh, it, it was a, a, a psychology that was reduced to natural structures and processes. Mm -hmm. um, much good has come of it over the last 100 and plus, 100 plus years. Uh, much that that Christians can take advantage of and and uh, and utilize, but uh, to this day, it, the the rules of the way psychology operates today is you cannot make reference to God as if He actually exists, and you certainly can't make reference to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So, in the, in the fifties, uh, thoughtful Christians began wrestling with. Uh, what, what, what does a Christian approach to this field look like? Um, and the, uh, the first folks that did this called themselves integrationists. Uh, they, they wanted to integrate their faith with uh, whatever discipline uh, that they, they were focusing on. And there were many in the field of counseling and, and psychotherapy that, that began doing that. 
Um, this seems like a laudable goal that, that we, uh, in, in some way, it's the goal of the Christian life to integrate my faith into everything that we do. And I think the original v- versions of that were, were quite helpful. Um, however, there, there uh, arose in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, mm-hmm. an, uh, a biblical counseling model. It used to be called nuthetic counseling, but Jay Adams in particular uh, rose a voice of protest against that pro- uh, project of integration because he recognized maybe more clearly than some of the integration leaders that the, that there was uh, that that the field of psychology and also psychiatry was was uh, currently compromised by naturalism and secularism and it couldn't be trusted it couldn't be just simply brought into the Christian faith without some risk to uh, to uh, impoverishing the faith and mm-hmm. and turning Christian counseling into a sort of secularized uh, religious based counseling, so uh, uh, another model developed biblical counseling that uh, sees itself as a calling people back to the Bible to use biblical resources and to rely on God for our healing. It tends to focus on sin as the primary problem as the Bible does. And it uh, has been something of a protest to this process. Uh, uh, Somewhere along the way, uh, a a group of uh, psychologists that were trained in mainstream psychology arose who were Christians, but who really believed that uh, the science of psychology is a science and it operates according to the rules of good science. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it uh, we ought not to integrate our faith into it. We ought to just do good work. We ought to do good statistics, good experimental design, and let the, the facts fall where they may. Uh, these folks have called themselves, or at least some of them, levels of explanation. And so they distinguish theology from psychology, and they try and keep them separate. Uh, at least they, don't, they won't make reference to the Bible uh, or, the, or the work of the Spirit. And, and so that's, that's a group that operates pretty successfully probably in public universities, but they're Christians, they love the Lord, they're serving the Lord, but they're doing so uh, a little bit more uh, covertly, we might say. And then uh, probably the most recent uh, uh, approach that's developed uh, is called Christian psychology. It takes its name, actually, from uh, an older uh, uh, a Christian philosopher in the 1800s, Christian, uh, Soren Kierkegaard, who called himself a Christian psychologist before Freud uh, did any of his work, before he was even born. And Christian psychology seeks to develop a distinctly Christian version of psychology where Christianity makes a difference. Mm-hmm. And so it's, we don't expect it's going to change neuropsychology in a radical sense. A neuron is a neuron, and non-Christians and Christians can do lots of good work uh, together collaboratively. But in, in some of the more complex areas of psychology and psychiatry where you're thinking about uh, personality uh, and psychopath- what can go wrong, psychopathology, psychotherapy, social psychology, where Christianity says a lot in the Bible and in the Christian tradition that gives us a different perspective on human beings. And so Christian psychology would be kind of the fourth view. That's, that's the model that I personally share, mm-hmm. although I have great sympathies for uh, uh, um, broad-minded biblical counseling that is not antagonistic to the science of psychology, but does recognize the value of the scriptures and the, that God's, uh, God has to be the center of, of, of uh, mm-hmm. Christian mm-hmm. counseling, biblical counseling. And I have deep sympathies for what I call strong integration, which is people who do deep integration in their work. I hope I do such things. Yeah. Uh, but I use the label Christian psychology because I am working to, to, uh, to promote the- psychological theory and research and, and counseling practices that are distinctly Christian. I think Christianity has enough rich resources that we can do uh, some, some distinct work on our own, and we ought to, to be doing that. So I'm challenging right. myself right. and others to do that kind yeah. of work. That's very helpful. So how, how, going on from that, how can Christian psychologists or counselors with these diverse views um, work together for mutual benefit and the health of the community? Or are these views completely exclusive to one another? Some, some people would say that they are exclusive. There's people on the extremes, I think, of both the, the, the pro-science uh, 
group and the, and the pro-Bible group who would say, if you're going to be true to our vision, then you have to be against what the others are doing. I think that's short-sighted and unnecessary. I think uh, that, that if we take a, a charitable view that, that we have brothers and sisters who differ from us, and of course mm -hmm. you find that in so many areas in, yep. in complex matters of culture and science and the arts and so on, but, it, but if you assume that there are reasons, good reasons why my brothers and sisters are, have taken this kind of position, then we can listen uh, to them and trust that they're being led by the Lord to, to fulfill their calling. And when we do that, I think we see that there are, there are good reasons why these, uh, these camps have developed, but that uh, the biblical counseling tends to be located in local churches. Uh, pastors do biblical counseling. I think they always have. I think that's a good way of thinking about the kind of counseling that they do. Um, people who are, who tend to be integrationists tend to work in um, in in settings that require following the rules of secular psychology, and and so they're trying to do that in a savvy and sophisticated way. Uh, so they integrate their faith uh, somewhat more covertly in our day, I think, than the original integration leaders did. But they're they're doing that because they want their programs to be credentialed and and they want to influence the field for good. I, I applaud that. I think that's that's great. That's their calling. Uh, I think a Christian psychology approach is is particularly useful in Christian universities. Uh, colleges, uh, seminaries that want to develop a distinctly uh, Christian uh, approach to, to the field. And I think that um, uh, 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 when you look at it this way, then you can say, well, different people are being called to different places in our culture, and we can support each other. We can uh, encourage each other to do uh, our respective uh, work mm -hmm. well and uh, still uh, be friends, I think. Yes. Yes, and although we may disagree on but some areas. But we can areas, still disagree. Yes, that's right. Good. right. That's, that's right. true. Yeah. So just bringing it down now to people who are seeking counseling, um, if someone is seeking help um, for either their own self or, or a loved one, um, what do they need to know in order to navigate these different views to get the help they need? Mm. Yeah, I uh, would... Uh, I think of the local church as the starting point for, for good Christian mental health care. Yes. And in my ideal world, uh, I, would, I think of the Christian community providing a continuum of care, beginning with the local church and going to the pastor and saying, you know, uh, this, is, this is what we're dealing with. Uh, what kind of help can you provide? And that um, a, a well-rounded, uh, thoughtful, uh, biblically trained pastor is going to be able to deal with a lot of common everyday problems that Christians faith in terms of the relationship with Christ and how to grow in, in their faith, how to avoid certain moral pitfalls and uh, repent of sin that they're struggling with, um, uh, how to deal with mild anxiety and depression uh, and um, uh, marriage conflict. I think there's so much wisdom in, in the Bible and wise pastoral counselors. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage people to go to their pastors and say, please help us. And, and, the, and, and in, an idea, in this ideal world, pastors would, would uh, relish the opportunity and would have uh, people that they see on a regular basis a few times and uh, uh, do, give the kind of help that, uh, that the pastor is equipped to give and then uh, be uh, trained ideally in some uh, kind of uh, assessment Mm -hmm. for um, being able to uh, assess, is this, is the problems that these uh, people are bringing to me beyond my training in the Bible, so, so that would warrant me uh, re uh, referring the person to my colleague, perhaps a pastor uh, for counseling in the church or a pastor for family life that's got additional training, or to refer outside to the church, particularly if it's a smaller church, they don't mm -hmm. have many resources, to Christians in the local community, Christian counselors that are licensed have a, a, a pastor uh, have a professional training that that can deal with more complex issues, and I consider on that continuum people who have doctoral level training, 
uh, in psychology to have the most advanced training to be able to deal with the most complicated problems, personality disorders, severe eating disorders, severe addiction, severe depression and anxiety. And for people who have a biological problem, and, and I think there are certain ways that we can, even mm -hmm. a pastor can do mm -hmm. some simple assessment, perhaps refer to then to a, a family physician and especially a psychiatrist when there's a suspicion that there may be a biological mm -hmm. uh, need. Uh, but in an ideal world, they would all of these folks would be Christians and they would all be Christ-centered and Holy Spirit-led and they would be working and collaborating together. And um, so, I, you know, I, we, I see that in some locales, but, but uh, it, you know, it's not, it's not fully right. functioning uh, across right. the world the way right. that it would be ideal. And in to... many places, it's far from ideal. Yes. We so that people honest. may need even to go for serious problems to secular counselors yes. because there is nobody else and, to go to and that's who exactly can help right. them. And, some, and, and there are good secular counselors who can help people with severe depression or severe anxiety, yes. even though they may not bring a biblical model yes. to bear on that. So th th there's something lacking in it, but it's certainly helpful. Yes. yes. Uh, I'd like to think that a pastoral counselor or a, a wise Christian friend could continue seeing someone who's seeing a secular therapist yes. or a non-Christian psychiatrist and continuing to provide Christ-centered guidance right. and, and biblical-based teaching to, to help the person see how ideally everything is related to Jesus. Right. Uh, can, you, can you say a little at this point about the concept of <clears throat> what I often call common grace wisdom mm. and where, how that fits uh, yes. in, in this? Uh, Paul makes this amazing statement in Colossians 2 that in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God knows everything. He knows everything he gave us in the Bible. And that's the most important stuff. It's kind of like he said, I really want you to know this stuff for all of history. I want you to know this. But he knows all kinds of things about how he created us and our brains and how humans develop and the complexities that can happen in a fallen world when we grow up with less than perfect parents and encounter abuse and things like that. And it, he allowed science to develop much more slowly. And particularly the human sciences didn't really develop until the 20th century. And so, but this knowledge God has had from before the foundation of the world and I, I have to believe that uh, he gave us this knowledge uh, through com what theologians call common grace. I like to call it creation grace because it's tied into the God's created order that, uh, that, that God gets a special kind of glory by sharing his knowledge with people who don't even know him. Mm -hmm. That's a very generous God that that uh, mm -hmm. that we have, and um, and and Acts fourteen seventeen says that He's given people fruitful seasons and gladness of heart, leaving uh, Himself a witness. These when He gives good things to non Christians to our culture, that's He's He's giving a witness. He's the Lord of the universe. So for the Christian community, I think it's it's a part of our. Uh, sort of our, uh, we're obligated by the, by the Holy Spirit to relish the treasures of science and the arts, to take captive these things for Christ, to, to celebrate them. And mm -hmm. so uh, we would, we, I, I think in principle, ought to be the most open to the good deliverances of well-done science in the natural sciences and the human sciences and take advantage of them, to use them for the glory of God in ways that are beyond the imagining of secularists. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, and, and so let's move on a little bit to another of the themes you've developed in your books, I think, and the concept of human flourishing. Mm. What is it, do you think, that causes, how would we define human flourishing from mm. a Christian perspective, and what enables that to happen? Mm -hmm. Foundational to a Christian psychology is uh, this old theological term called the image of God, it, it's, I think it captures uh, so much richness in a uh, Christian understanding of psychology that, of course, is going to be left out of a secular model. But what it, uh, one of the many things that it conveys to us immediately is that we are made for relationship with our Creator. And, and to understand our flourishing, we have to understand something about God. 
Uh, John Calvin was a great Christian psychologist, mm -hmm. uh, though he's not often understood as such. But one, I mean, he's a great theologian who talked about great psychological concepts. He opened the institutes with this brilliant insight that the mm -hmm. knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves are intimately interwoven. And he says this amazing thing, which one comes first, I cannot tell. They're, they're so interwoven yeah. in human life. And, and I think that's right at the heart of what it means to be in the image of God. So a flourishing human being is going to be one who is in love with God and who knows God. Now, we know as Christians and because of biblical revelation that we can't know God apart from his spirit and apart from him regenerating us and giving us a new heart and a new mind to be able to read the Bible and see the treasures that are there, that many of them, uh, many of the truths in the Bible are not uh, available to uh, pure natural science techniques or empirical uh, uh, measures. Uh, we need to have them revealed to us. We need to, to, to have the, uh, the, the power of the Holy Spirit talked about and, and shared with us. We need to understand something about sin, that, that we are born in a world where we are n natively now uh, 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 alienated from our Creator. Um, sin blinds us, and so if, that is, if, we're not, if, if we're not revealed that information, we're not going to come upon it naturally as it were. And so the Bible is intrinsic to this uh, description of what a flourishing human being is, and we need it in order to give us what Calvin says are spectacles to see the creation aright. Uh, I, I uh, think, uh, well, the Bible also teaches us that uh, the great commandments, uh, that, we, that we love God, and uh, that flourishing involves loving God, but it also means loving our neighbor. And, and uh, so a flourishing human being is going to be one that's well, uh, that is able to commune with others, is, is able to trust others and be trusting with them, is going to be able to um, uh, understand others and understand uh, him or herself in relationship to others. And uh, I think that in a, in a cap, in, encapsulates a, 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 a kind of Christian understanding of flourishing. I, I think we can also, though, uh, benefit from reading many things that non-Christians have uncovered in, in what uh, uh, constitutes a healthy human being mm -hmm. as well. And uh, there's been a lot of research in positive psychology and in family systems in human development that, that also helps to elaborate the picture that the Bible gives us at the center, what's most mm -hmm. important. But there are, there are other things as well that I think Can give Can you us, give an example of, yeah, of that? Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the most important findings of modern psychology, I think uh, from a Christian standpoint, is attachment literature. What, what uh, uh, apparently God created uh, children, infants, to need to form a healthy emotional bond with their primary caregivers. And if that goes awry for a, uh, you know, a variety of reasons, that can wreak uh, havoc. That can cause biological and psychosocial damage that gets woven into the brains of children who mm -hmm. have been severely neglected or severely abused at two, three, four, five years of age. And, and there's been a revolution of research on the effects of trauma on children, in, uh, research on what happens in, in uh, ad adoption institutions where the children are not properly cared for, it leading to mental impairment. All of that connected to this uh, finding that humans uh, in, in the earliest years, need to develop a healthy attachment to their primary caregivers. That's implicit in biblical revelation, but nowhere does God highlight this particular need for a strong emotional bond that right. I think enriches our understanding of how God has constituted us as relational beings growing up. Right, right. And you mentioned earlier today the research on gratitude Mm -hmm. Can you say a little more about that? Yeah, a fascinating body of literature, much of it done by Christians, studying that there are significant um, psychological benefits from doing a simple gratitude exercise. At the end of the day, write down three things that you're grateful for mm. and do that for 90 days. And they found that there are significant elevation in mood, mm -hmm. uh, release of stress, and anxiety from having this kind of a simple right. habit that makes 
perfect sense from a Christian standpoint actually doesn't make as much sense from an evolutionary standpoint. What, 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 a, you know, what would evolution, how would that lead to gratitude? It's, it's quite ironic, I think. But um, these are the kinds of findings that I think uh, empirical yes. research actually bolsters right. a Christian worldview. Yeah, I hear, I hear uh, non-Christians talking about be, having gratitude to the universe yeah. for, for you know, the sunshine or whatever it is, or for yes. friends. So let, in, in thinking then, you've talked a lot about what causes humans to flourish, thinking about psychopathology. Um, is there a difference between the way the secular world sees psychopathology and the way we as Christians would see it or mm -hmm. define it? Yeah, because of the worldview of naturalism is so reductionistic, it reduces human beings largely mm -hmm. to organisms. And so they can't ask deeper questions about human beings. Now, there, there, there are some, there's minority folks in secular psychology called humanistic psychologists and some positive psychologists are in that group who do have a more enhanced view. Mm -hmm. But the dominant approach is naturalism. And so they tend to focus on what can go wrong with us biologically and what can go wrong with us developmentally. That's important, I think, from a Christian standpoint. We don't want to neglect that. That, right. that uh, things can go wrong in a fallen world. Where the Bible teaches that that's going to happen in Genesis chapter 3. There's going to be problems in human relationships, and, and, and there's going to be kinds of suffering that wouldn't happen in a perfect uh, Eden. Uh, so I, I think Christians have a reason to be interested in the kinds of things that can go wrong with us biologically as well as psychosocially. However, the Bible has highlighted a set of problems that that God wants us to take most seriously and he's mm -hmm. we, we use the English word sin as the the word to translate the biblical terminology that 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 highlights certain kinds of problems in human functioning alienation from God mm -hmm. and being at enmity with people made in God's image and so mo the Bible concentrates its attention on the disorder I want to call it a psychological disorder. Sin is the worst kind of psychological disorder that human beings have because it keeps us away from our creator. It makes us mm -hmm. think that we can live autonomously from him. What a, what a terrible tragedy. As, as awful a disorder as schizophrenia is, it's, it's a terrible, devastating disorder having biological and psychosocial implications mm -hmm. that devastate a life. But I know people with schizophrenia who love Jesus. And so as bad a disorder as schizophrenia it is, it doesn't keep people away from God as sin does. And, and, and sin is far more ubiquitous. It affects every human being uh, by, by uh, a, being, a fallen being. Now, uh, all human beings are saddled with this disorder, this, this most tragic of all disorders. So the Bible rightly directs our attention to sin as the worst sort of problem and one that God has handily addressed mm -hmm. by himself taking our sin upon himself in the, in the Son of God, uh, living a life uh, that we were meant to live but, but could not live as sinners overcoming sin in his own life and in his death, taking our sin upon himself, um, and, uh, and then being raised from the dead uh, to overcome sin. So um, all of that is God's intervention to overcome the worst uh, psychological disorder that we have. Uh, a third component, I think, of a holistic approach to psychopathology is going to recognize and highlight the, the, the problem of suffering. I've already yeah. alluded to it, that, that suffering can begin in, in infancy if we're raised with poor parents who are unskilled and, mm -hmm. and have their own problems mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. sin and so forth. Um, but, but in growing up in a fallen world then, that can, uh, the way that God has designed humans to develop, that can lead to forms of damage, biological, psychosocial damage, that, that can have its own kinds of suffering as we gr be, uh, uh, get older and it interacts with our genetic damage uh, predispositions that we might have so that we can develop anxiety disorders, personality disorders, eating disorders. Um, schizophrenia, psychotic disorders uh, mm -hmm. in adulthood, mo uh, mu they tend to develop m more later in, in, in early adulthood. 
Um, and so I think a holistic approach to uh, psychopathology from a Christian standpoint is going to recognize sin's the worst problem, but we grow up in a suffering world, and there can, because of genetic problems and growing up in suffering, we can develop psychological disorders that, um, that are identified as psychopathology in our culture. I think uh, we want to take into account all of that in order yes. to help God's people become more whole. And, yes. with, and I also have to add the, uh, one uh, very important thing is that we, we as Christians, we don't expect a, a perfect functioning in this world. Uh, Jesus has, has, uh, has freed us from the penalty of sin and he's freeing us from uh, some of the power of sin, but we're, but we're never going to be perfectly free from the power of sin in this life. It's an ongoing daily battle. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Similarly, our damage doesn't get automatically cured in this life as much as we wish it would. And so part of the journey in this life is learning to cope both with uh, some, some mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. of damage. Some people have much worse uh, situations than others. Some people are relatively undamaged. Some people have more suffering than others. Um, uh, some people struggle with sins more because of these other problems, but everybody has a kind of sin problem that remains uh, right. a part of our uh, right. life experience right. until we die. And that's what we long for, is being freed mm -hmm. from our damage, from mm -hmm. suffering, and from sin in heaven forever with God. So just if I can clarify, and I think I'm hearing you saying that our suffering especially physical or psychological suffering, does come from sin, but we need to discriminate between living in the fallen world, which is a result of Adam and Eve's sin. Yes. That's no fault of our own. And we may suffer because of other people's sins who have abused or hurt or damaged us. And then we also suffer because of our own sin, yes. personal sin, That's right. uh, in how we respond to those things. And then... To bring in another fact here, the Bible seems to speak about the power of evil and speaks of the devil causing suffering. Yes. Can you say a little bit about that yeah. uh, and how that fits into suffering? Yes, so there is um, a, a dimension that's, that's often left out, well, it's left out of all secular models, but even uh, Christians, sometimes we forget that there is a a personal power that is against God, a person uh, known as Satan, the devil, who uh, in some way rules over this world and over uh, demonic forces that can cause problems, uh, most obviously demonic possession or oppression. We see this more clearly right now in the third world, but, uh, uh, but this, is, this is something that can happen in this life. And in a way that we don't fully understand, Satan is the power behind all evil that happens to us. We see this taught clearly in the book of Job, that, mm -hmm. that Satan asked permission to wreak havoc in, in Job's life and uh, causes terrible suffering to Job, mm -hmm. uh, including physical uh, illness, uh, some, mm -hmm. some sort of physical malady that he had. So while we don't understand uh, precisely how supernatural uh, enemies of ours cause problems, we recognize that there is a supernatural dimension to physical and psychological and spiritual difficulties that humans have here that we need to be aware of and pray against right. and resist. Right. Okay. So when I would say as a counselor, I sit down with someone who has been through very difficult circumstances in their lives, comes with depression, anxiety. What are some of the sort of the basic principles for a Christian of, uh, of counseling or a pastor faced with someone like that? Mm -hmm. where, would you, where would you begin in helping them to think about, what do I do here? Yeah. You've described some of the causes, so how do I approach this? Yeah, well, I, I, I would say that um, we all can, get, can use more education, both in the Bible and, and in science, that will help us to be more effective in, in, in uh, our ministries, in our work. I, I think of, I approach people uh, with, uh, from four dimensions. Mm -hmm. I've, I've broadly uh, referenced them, but the biological, the psychosocial, the ethical, which I think particularly pertains to um, 
sins that I commit against people that I can be caught up in, and then my spiritual relationship with Christ. And so when, when I uh, do assessment, I want to be mindful of all four of those yeah. uh, potential problem areas. So there are, you know, if a person is so sad that they're weeping throughout the whole session, I'm going to assume, given my training and experience, that there's probably something biological going on, as well as some deep level of suffering that they're in, encountering. But if they're crying un, almost uncontrollably, I'm going to be at least thinking that there may be a biological problem here. And there are there are certain things, you know, uh, symptoms that we can look for to uh, to be aware of a biological problem. Now, I'm not licensed to treat a biological problem, so I would refer out for uh, if I was suspicious. When you say a biological problem, you mean severe depression. Severe depression, a psychotic depression. episode. The person's not uh, talking, making sense. They're uh, maybe hallucinating, uh, seeing things that right. nobody else sees. Right. Those, are, those are some obvious markers that there's something biologically going wrong that, that may need to be addressed by someone trained to do that. Um, I'm also, uh, you, you know, honestly, I, I work from the top down, so I, I should have begun uh, thinking, I'm first going to wonder, how are they doing spiritually? I'm going to ask them about their devotional life. What's their relationship like with Christ? Uh, that the most important thing I can give someone as a, as a Christian counselor is to help them learn how to become more effective in their devotion time. I would like all of my counselees to spend a half hour or more in devotion time. I, I call devotion time soul work time. It's, it involves worship, reading the uh, word of God, but, but I, eventually I'm going to want them to transition to spend some time working on some issue in their lives. And, and I see that as God kind of desiring us to do, to take care of ourselves every day, you know, inviting him into our psychological struggles and, and our conflicts in life. And so I'm, I'm going to want to help them most importantly to, uh, to, to see how they're doing in their spiritual life. I'm going to want to check in on their ethical life. Are, are there some areas of inconsistency uh, with with what 's normal for Christian health, uh, are they living in sin in some way? Is there some secret pattern of of life sin that they 're struggling with that i 'm going to want to uh, help them uh, address and I think for the a, a lot of problems can be addressed uh, I, I would say something like fifty to two thirds of the problems that Christians struggle with can be addressed with. Um, uh, focusing them, uh, helping them to develop in their spiritual life and to learn how to repent of, of, of uh, sin patterns in their lives. But there's going to be a group of people, a third to 50%, who are going to have a, a level of problem that's going to require probably more understanding of their family of origin uh, some some sort of patterns that have developed in their thinking, in their emotional uh, life, in their relational patterns that are going to require, I think, greater sophistication to sort through and to help a person sort through. And for that, I recommend uh, uh, referring to uh, a skilled professional who has training in those kind of more complex areas that hopefully is just as Christ-centered is going to bring Jesus into these more complicated disorders and pattern, uh, uh, life patterns. And there what we're going to find is that it's not so much identifying a particular sin or sin pattern that they need to repent of, but it's that sin and brokenness and suffering are so interwoven in their life experience yeah. that it, it's going to require some time to sort out uh, the, where... Uh, where suffering plays a role, where damage is playing a role, mm -hmm. where their sin plays a role. And, and that's, I think, uh, going to require a long, usually uh, months to years of therapy with more s s serious problems. And there are, are fortunately, in at least large cities, Christians who are uh, able to, to help with those kinds yes. of problems. Yes, right. So you've spoken there about a whole range from the very simplest uh, to much more complex mm -hmm. problems. Um, <clears throat> that, so the pastor can deal with the simpler ones or just a friend or a counselor within the church. Others need to be referred on to people with more experience. I think that's a responsible approach of recognizing yeah. skills and knowledge uh, right, right. that builds, yeah. in the body of, builds on the body of Christ. Right. Right. Strengths, yeah, and and all of this, of course, we 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 speak 
very often with the ideal of what we would like mm. to happen. Mm. So often, so many people are lacking the resources or lacking any training in counseling. And for that reason, we are here trying to help others to develop these skills. Yeah. So Eric, I really appreciate your wisdom, your skill that you've developed over the years, your, the books that you've written. Mm. And uh, thank you for doing this interview with me today. Thank you. Today.